What's going on besties? Today we're going to be talking about the ATIT's version 7 English portion of the exam, more specifically vocabulary acquisition. Let's get started. Effective academic writing involves meticulous planning, drafting, and revising. Although the writing process varies from one individual to another, adhering to five fundamental steps can provide a structured approach when answering these types of questions on the ATITs. Step one includes pre-writing. Selecting a topic in this stage is paramount. Optimal topics often stem from unresolved questions, offering perfect exploration for your writing. You can define a broad idea into a focused argument or inquiry. For instance, Narrowing down a topic for an essay could progress as follows. You start with the idea of 19th century literature. Then you narrow it down to novels in the Romantic period. Narrowing down even further, we get the novels of Jane Austen, leading us to our ultimate topic of theme of theater in Mansfield Park. With a clearly defined topic, the next steps involve stream of consciousness, brainstorming, and mind mapping. Starting with stream of consciousness, this is a literary technique designed to capture the unfolding of the author's thoughts in a manner that mirrors reality. This approach incorporates elements like free association, writing down everything that comes to mind without worrying about grammar, punctuality, or even coherence to deepen your grasp on the topic's psychological landscape as well as perspective. For instance, while heading to record this video, my thought process wouldn't be, I'm walking into my office, when I get there, I'm gonna say good morning besties to the camera and begin recording. I really hope it goes well. That's not really an accurate representation of what it is we think. A more accurate representation could be, it's hot, oh, these lights are so bright, I need to close my blinds. Why isn't my computer working? Why am I struggling getting the words out? Why are my dogs barking again every single time I do a live? My seat is really uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, I look so pale. That's actually a more accurate definition of stream of consciousness. It's just like writing down the words as they come to you. Brainstorming involves a method of generating a wide range of ideas on a topic without immediate evaluation and is more structured in its approach. This process still encourages that free thinking and the exploration of any and all ideas as they come to you, no matter how unconventional that they may seem. For example, maybe your topic is climate change and you start writing down any and all ideas that would come to mind that could possibly affect that climate change. Once all of that brainstorming is done, then you can move on to mind mapping, which is an even more structured form of brainstorming that visually organizes that information. You can start with a central idea or theme and expand outwards in a radial fashion using lines, symbols, words, colors, and images that are gonna to connect to the related idea. If you've ever done a vision board, this is kind of what mind mapping actually is. Mind maps are particularly useful in visualizing relationships between different aspects of a topic, making complex information easier to understand and navigate. Step two in the writing process is writing. You're going to create your first draft and it doesn't have to follow a strict sequence. You might find it effective to start with the body of your text, leaving the introduction until later when you have a better understanding of what you're introducing. Leverage your outline as a structural guide for your writing. Begin crafting each paragraph methodically. Start with a topic sentence that's going to introduce the main idea of the paragraph. Next, you want to present evidence that's going to support that argument. Then you want to explain and analyze that evidence. That's where we are going to start classifying all of those supporting details. And then lastly, you want to conclude by summarizing what your analysis infers or proves. This can be the overall main idea of your passage. The primary objective in this phase is to complete a draft. With a draft in hand, you can focus on refining and enhancing your work afterwards. Step three in the process and the most commonly missed process is conferencing. Writing conferences are collaborative meetings between writers and peers as well as instructors. They discuss a piece of writing to provide feedback and suggestions for improvement. These conferences can occur at any stage within the writing process from the initial planning all the way up to the final revisions. The focus is on constructive criticism with the goal of enhancing clarity, coherence, and overall impact of the writer's work. For example, a student might meet with their professor to discuss the first draft of a research paper. 
During this conference, the professor might highlight areas where arguments need some strengthening, suggest additional resources for the research, as well as identify sections that require clarification. The student will then use that feedback to refine their paper, making it more persuasive and polished. Writing conferences ultimately serve as an invaluable tool for writers seeking to develop their skills and produce more effective written communications. Step four is the revision process. During this stage, you're gonna turn a critical eye towards your initial draft to pinpoint areas ripe for enhancement. Allowing your draft to sit for a day or two after completion can help rejuvenate that viewpoint. During this phase, focus on identifying and addressing major concerns, such as arguments that lack clarity or logic, sections that could benefit from rearrangement for better coherence, and instances where further detail is necessary, or any content that does not contribute to the central thesis. Our fifth and final step is editing. This step involves refining your text to ensure that there is clarity, structural integrity, and error-free writing. During this editing phase, focus on eliminating grammatical mistakes, clarifying any kind of ambiguous expression, and reducing redundancy and repetition to achieve concise and grammatical sound text. This also includes checking for the use of American and British spelling and punctuation. Remember that the T's is testing you on American spelling as well as uniform capitalization in your titles and your headings. It's also important to remember to accurately cite your sources. It gives credit to the original authors, allowing readers to find the original source of information. In science, we use the APA style for citations when we're referencing work. So starting with in-text citations, this is a brief method of acknowledging the origin of the specific information, guiding the readers to matching the entry in the reference list of your document's conclusion. This citation typically includes the author's surname, the year of the publication, and when referencing a particular segment of a source, you may specify the page number or another identifier like a timestamp paragraph number, or heading. When the citation refers to the source in its entirety, page numbers are not necessary. There are two methods when we embed in-text citations, parenthetical and narrative, also known as paraphrasing. In parenthetical citations, we enclose the author's name and the year of publication within parentheses. We position these details at the sentence's end, immediately preceding the period, like we see in our example. The author claims that the beta blockers are the best medications for hypertension. We put our parentheses, I'm sorry, our quotation marks around the actual phrase that came directly from the author. And then we put in parentheses, Smith, the year of the publication, and even the page number if we're citing something specific in that author's writing. In narrative citations or paraphrasing, we integrate some of the citation details directly into the text. In this approach, the year and if applicable, the page number are going to be enclosed in parentheses. This can be immediately placed following the author's name within the sentence or at the sentence's conclusion just before the final period. What makes this citation different is we don't use quotation marks because we're not immediately referring and verbally phrasing specifically what was in the text. We are paraphrasing. So let's take a look at our example. According to Smith, parentheses 2022, that lets us know we're referring to a author's work. Research has shown that metoprolol is the best medication for hypertension based on the following statistics. This information is being paraphrased from what we found within Mr. Smith's information of his article. Same thing with our next example. Smith states that research has shown that metoprolol is the best medication for hypertension based on the following statistics. And again, we're referencing work. So in our parentheses, we would put the year of the work as well as the page number. For sources with two authors, we place the ampersand, which is this symbol here, between their names followed by the publication year, like we see with Chung and Taylor, 2024. For sources with three or more authors, mention only the first author's name, which would be Chung, and then you're gonna add the et al, period, comma, and then followed by the publication year in order for that to be correct. 
So when we're dealing with sources that lack certain crucial details, here's how we're going to navigate that situation in order to make sure that we're referencing appropriately. So if the author's name is missing, but the responsible organization is known, for instance, Nurse Chung, we would use that. So we would use Nurse Chung, comma, 2024, or maybe if we had the title, but we didn't know the organization, we could say T's Guide, comma, 2024. If the source lacks a publication year, we use N period D period to let us know that there is no date available. So for direct quotes that lack a specific page number, we can use other identifiers. We can use a timestamp, which we would be Chung, comma, 2024, comma, the timestamp 2013. We can use a chapter if we know that, Chung, comma, 2024, comma, chapter four. Or if we know the paragraph number, we can also use that. Chung, comma, 2024, comma, P-A-R-A, -A, period, which stands for paragraph, and the number three. So let's talk about prefixes and suffixes. What are they exactly? Simply put, a prefix is a segment of a word placed at the start of the word, and a suffix is added at the end of a word. It's crucial to note that not every word is going to be accompanied by a prefix or a suffix. Take, for instance, the word dog, which does not feature either. Similarly, chair and run lack these additions despite being frequently used words. This highlights that prefixes and suffixes are applicable to certain words rather than universally across the language. What's interesting is that prefixes and suffixes significantly alter the word's meaning that they are affixed to. Take, for example, the word like, which conveys a positive sentiment. By adding the prefix dis, D-I-S, to that word, it's going to transform it into dislike, which is a reversal of that original sentiment. To dislike something is to imply a negative emotion toward it or a lack of affinity for it. Similarly, we have the word happy. When we add the prefix un, it changes it to unhappy, representing a state that is distinctly different from being happy. There are countless prefixes in the English language, but among them, the most common ones that you will see on the T's is dis, miss, un, re, pre, im, and in. Next, let's talk about suffixes. Let's consider the word teach, which denotes the action of instructing. By adding the suffix able, A-B-L-E, it transforms the word into teachable, changing its nature from an action to a characteristic. Teachable describes someone or something that can be taught, indicating their ability to learn. Another example could be hope, which represents a concept or feeling. Adding the suffix full, F-U-L, alters the word hope into hopeful, which is an adjective that describes the state of being filled with hope. Some frequently encountered suffixes that you're going to see on the T's is able, ism, ship, ness, meant, less, I, and os, O-U-S. It's really important that you familiarize yourself with both these prefixes and these suffixes. You're also gonna be tested on two different kinds of suffixes. You're gonna have inflection and derivational suffixes. Each type is going to play a different role in how they modify the base word for which they are added. Inflectional suffixes change the form of the word to express different grammatical categories, such as tense, mood, voice, aspect, person, number, gender, and case without changing the actual meaning of the word. For example, adding the letter S to the end of cat makes it cats, indicating that we have now made a plural. Thus, the word cat is still referring to the same animal. Now we just happen to have more of them. Inflectional suffixes are limited to a small set, and they do not change the part or speech of the word. Derivational suffixes modify the base word in more profound ways, often changing its meaning and typically its parts of speech. For example, adding the suffix less to fear forms fearless, which means without fear. Derivational suffixes can turn nouns into adjectives, verbs into nouns, and so forth. They can significantly alter the semantic meaning of the base word. Now, there are some words that are formed by combining both a prefix and a suffix to the base word. Take the base word respect, which conveys a concept of admiration and esteem. By adding the prefix dis, it changes the word to disrespect, flipping its meaning to a significantly more negative concept, meaning that now we have a lack of respect. To further add, we can add the suffix 
full. Again, changing disrespect to disrespectful, which is an adjective describing someone or an action that shows a blatant lack of respect, perhaps manifesting in poor treatment of others. For another illustration, we can use the base word use, which signifies the action of employing something for a purpose. By adding the prefix re to use, it transforms the word into reuse, indicating the action of using something again. We can also go further by adding the suffix able. So reuse becomes reusable, shifting to a much different descriptive quality. Now we have an item that can be used more than once. Now let's do some examples of how to identify prefixes and suffixes. Starting with our first example, we have the word pain less. So pain is actually our root word and less is the suffix in this word. Next up we have decision. So that ION that's on the act and the end of decision is actually a suffix for the word decision. Now we have the word remove. So again, move is going to be our base word and that RE at the beginning of remove is going to be our prefix. And just like with remove, we have the same thing with preview. So view is going to be our root word and that word pre here at the beginning of that is going to be our prefix. Next up we have enjoyable. So enjoy would actually be the root word of this word and that able here on the end is going to be our suffix. Now replacement can be a little bit tricky. So with replacement, we actually have a prefix and we have a suffix. So place is actually our base word. Re is going to be our prefix and meant is going to be our suffix. Next up, we have the word window. So this one's even more tricky. So window is one of those words that you cannot attach a prefix or a suffix to, just like we talked about with the word dog. So in this case, we have neither a prefix or suffix. And then lastly, we have inactivity. Just like we saw with replacement, we have both a prefix and a suffix with this word. In is going to be our prefix, and itty, I-T-Y, is going to be our suffix. And lastly, let's talk about how we're going to determine word meaning. The tease is going to test you on word meaning and definitions without providing you with the definition term. In order to understand words without context clues, you must break them down into their parts to decipher what they mean. A memory trick for this is to remember other words that have the same kind of parts that you might be familiar with in order to identify words that you're not. So imagine that you're reading or watching a video and you encounter a new word like disband. You might have no idea what this word means. So we need to think about words with the same prefix and compare them. Disband has two parts, dis and band. Focusing on that first part, dis, think about words that you're familiar with that start with dis, like disappear. You know that the prefix dis means not or opposite of, and appear means to become visible. If we put these words together, what do we get? We get disappear, which means to stop being visible. From this, you can deduce that the prefix dis often indicates a reversal or negation. Now, let's consider the second part of the word band. You might immediately think about a rock band, which is a group of people that come together to make music. More broadly, band can be a group of people united for a common purpose. There's even the verb phrase band together, meaning to form a group. So now that we've broken it down, can you guess what disband means? Exactly. Disband refers to a group of people deciding to no longer stay together. Thus, an organization or club might disband, signifying that they were once united but are now separate. Often, you can understand the meaning of words just by analyzing the parts that you know and applying the knowledge to a new word. In doing so, you become like a detective figuring out the meaning of the word without resorting to a dictionary. And many times, your guesses are going to be correct. I hope that this information was helpful in understanding vocabulary acquisition when it comes to the T's English portion of the exam. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there is a ton of additional resources to help you ace those ATITs exams. And as always, I'm going to catch you in the next video. Bye!